Ja, Marlies. <laughs> ja, I just want to say welcome uh, to the Breast Cancer Support Group meeting for August. And um, our theme for this evening is facing breast cancer treatment while also facing the COVID pandemic. Mm. So, and I'd you know, just like to welcome Dr. Meyerberg as well, who's our uh, cancer surgeon here at the Panorama Center for Surgical Oncology. Um, and yeah, anyone who'd like to ask a question uh, regarding cancer treatment or regarding cancer treatment during the COVID pandemic, you're more than welcome uh, to do so. Um, yeah, just from my point of view as a, as a psychologist, I think uh, facing challenges like COVID um, or cancer treatment is obviously extremely um, uh, stressful and it's also normal that it's going to cause feelings of fear and anxiety um, so I think it's important I don't know Etienne would you like to say something first about COVID and cancer before <laughs> I give people a few hints on dealing with it from a psychological perspective no I think it's been a it's been a difficult uh, you know year and a half for for everyone um, and I think uh, you know, if you, if you think about the, the, you know, the stresses that you have in life, uh, you know, the, the things of sort of losing, losing loved ones, uh, moving house, getting a disease yourself, um, uh, you know, I, I, I just think this has been an exceedingly challenging time. Financially, it's been a challenging time for everyone. So, um, yes, there's so, definitely so many on so many levels because mm. it's economically, it's socially, it's uh, emotionally, mm. uh, physically, it's a very, very trying time. Yeah, and I, you know, I mean, there's no recipe book for this. So, you, you, I almost want to say the last time we had a major, you know, worldwide event was with World War Two. So, so, um, so this is the, the, the difficult part. There's uh, people, you know. know almost none of us have lived through an era like this no. so it is new everybody's trying to cope and learning to cope as best we can and mm -hmm. um you know i think that makes it that makes it quite quite difficult so mm -hmm. and i mean then obviously having to face cancer and I, and i think that the fact is when you have a big issue then your 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 support structure is what's really important though the people around you uh, mm -hmm. social support and now all of a sudden, you know, you're faced with uh, with with a disease like cancer, and 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 you can't go and visit your people, your parents. You know, you're afraid that you're going to make people sick. So yes, difficult. It's, it's more difficult. You know, things that are supposed to help, like your support system and network. It's 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 more difficult to access support with this crisis. So it's just you know, making a already difficult thing even more difficult. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, Etienne. Would you like to tell us a bit about the situation with COVID at the moment? Uh, we we obviously sitting still in, in in the third way. You know, if we look at national figures, we're definitely seeing sort of that there's a downward trend. Uh, I mean, I've got some graphs. I've I've prepared a few slides to explain a few things. What I'll maybe do is let me um if you see the day to day figures run a little bit differently. They don't they don't have this nice sort of smooth structure that's going on so in principle day to day you have to sort of up and down up and down up and down but what they've done with this draft is that they've actually sort of made it into a more sort of homogeneous uh, graph that you can see uh, you can see that you know we are just over the, the 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 tip of the third wave you can also see how many more uh, cases we had versus the the summer wave that we had in in december um but you know, I think what we are seeing is we we not we're not seeing this sort of very sharp downward trend that we would be seeing. You can see what happened in December is it went up very rapidly, we peaked, and then it again came down very rapidly, and it and that same pattern um, was followed almost throughout the whole country. And now we're seeing a different picture. We're seeing that you know in the in the whole of South Africa that uh, we are coming down. But in some provinces like the Western Cape, we're actually seeing that we really sort of over the peak and we sort of almost plateauing a little bit, coming down much slower than what it used to be in the past. And there are some provinces where we in the last few days we're now actually seeing the, the figures going up again. So so it, it you know it's difficult, 
uh, we're certainly not out of the sticks yet and we were certainly hoping that we would be seeing much higher you know vaccination figures and so on by now which we're not seeing and i think that unfortunately is is is, is driving part of this uh, sort of uh, lengthened recovery so so why, yeah. why do you think is it why are people so hesitant to get this the vaccination you know i think the if you think back, you know, when they when to introduced polio vaccine, for example, I mean, polio vaccine wasn't tested extensively. The, the, the concept of a vaccine was developed. Uh, they developed this vaccine. Now, I mean, if you look at photos, if you go on Google and you type in polio epidemic, you'll see whole hospital wards with like, you know, 50, 60 beds. Uh, with those old iron lung machines that they used to ventilate patients with. And I mean, People forget that's you know that's the pity that people's memory is so short and you don't you forget about how, what the impact was of polio. I mean I remember when you would go into every corner cafe, every shop, there was always that little girl with her with her with her iron braces on her leg, that little statue with a little box that you could put money into to donate for polio. Mm -hmm. And and um, and now you don't see that anymore. So and you don't see people who's had polio because a lot of those people have died, you know, so now people have forgotten. That's the one thing. The second thing is, uh, you know, your source of information, you know, when, when, you were, when you were young, if you wanted to know something, you went to the library and you got the, the Encyclopedia Britannica or whatever, and you would read in that, and that would be, you know, your that was your truth, I want to say. <laughs> and now, and, and, and you know that someone took, you know, professor so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so took years and years and they wrote that that uh, chapter on, you know, vaccination in the, the, the encyclopedia. And now all of a sudden, everybody can make a website. Anybody can do a Facebook post. Anybody can make a YouTube video and throw it out there. And the reality, and the, and the thing is with Google and with, with, with the internet is, Number one, there is no filter. So no one has to prove, you know, I, for me to be able to do an operation on you, I have to pass all these exams. I have to study, you know, 12 years. And and so whenever, you know, if I if I walk in the street and I ask someone, listen, you know, can I maybe do an operation on you? They're going to ask me, are you a doctor, number one? And number two is, you know, are you actually a qualified surgeon? Yeah. No one's going to allow the first guy they meet to just do an operation on them. And yet what we're doing is, you know, we're getting this feed from Facebook and YouTube and everywhere. And, and no one ever, ever asks, okay, wait a minute, you know, let me see this, the, the credentials. And, and it's, it's easy to say, yes, but I know a doctor that, or, you know, everybody mm -hmm. has heard about the doctor or the professor or the someone, but mm -hmm. no one actually ever goes and says, okay, let me just find out a little bit you know, what's happened, or, you know, who is this person, you know, is it, is it the type of person that I would trust my life with? Would I allow this person to treat my cancer? Well, recently, as you probably know, there, there was actually a very uh, respected uh, surgeon who did make a comment, so I think that must also be very confusing for people. Yeah. Well, yeah, that they actually also... Uh, Think if this is someone who yeah. actually has a lot of credentials, yeah. why if they are anti-vaccination and <laughs> cause a lot of so the problem yeah, I think that people to... don't understand, I think, is they, they always think, you know, okay, so you know, you think that someone's a doctor and therefore that person is a scientist. Mm -hmm. If we think scientists, so the idea be between science is to say, I observe something in nature. I, I, I see that, uh, you know, a tree has green leaves and I go and I do experiments and I find out that there's chlorophyll in those, those leaves and they, they convert carbon dioxide to oxygen. So I, I, have to, I have to investigate to see that I can prove my suspicion with good basic evidence. When you're a doctor, actually, you get taught by Professor so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so that says, listen, uh, these are the five signs of, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, TB, you know, or these are the five important uh, causes of bowel obstruction. Um, and if Professor asks you on a ward round, you know, then you have to ramble those five things. But no one ever actually asks you to say, listen, go and look at a 200 patients that have bowel obstruction, and then you find out what the five most common causes are of that bowel obstruction. So when you become a doctor, you are never expected really 
to to do real you know research if i can call it that or to to, to quantify and to find the evidence for what you are taught so there is a big database online called medline medline collects every single publication that is done in a peer-reviewed journal so if i publish something I, we, we published in july in june we published the paper in the breast on the cost effect of mama print in breast cancer from the time that that research took us three years to do i submitted that paper for publication in february it took four months and two sets of reviewers to actually go through my work check that what i've written there is actually correct and and reproducible and then only that they say congratulations we'll accept your publication for 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 the paper so so the reality is one when i publish something in a peer-reviewed journal it means that i have i've passed that burden of proof to say that this that i have written is something that anybody can check and that will be true mm. now if you go on mainline and you type in there dr etienne myberg then you will find all the publications of mine in peer-reviewed journals okay the majority of medical doctors never ever go onto medline they never ever go and look at the publications that has happened and they never ever read those publications that have that have that is really the basis of proof for what we do if i treat cancer it is because lots of different people have published that if we treat a patient with tamoxifen versus whatever that patient will do a lot better than the patient that didn't get the moxifer so so everything that we do at paxo and you know all the oncologists we, well we will say these treatment protocols have been evidence-based proven protocols that we can trust we can say there are twenty thousand women that have had this treatment versus something else and this is better than that so because doctors generally a lot of them do not follow that principle of going back to the basis of evidence their worldview and their opinion is really formed by youtube and you know just like professor x that taught me do an operation this way and i just said yes professor i'll do it most doctors never ever go and say well is that really the best way of doing that operation and going to find the evidence for that and that creates a problem that now you are a doctor people expect you to be truthful and to be well educated and yet your opinion really is based on the same thing that they base their opinion on mm -hmm. and that is unfortunately a problem mm -hmm. that is the reason why we have people that's why we have people that say listen chemotherapy will kill you or you should not treat breast cancer you're not you shouldn't you know operate on a breast cancer because if it gets air then it's going to grow and it's going to get worse mm -hmm. um so and that unfortunately is because of people that they have never really delved into the root evidence for what we have in terms of cancer mm. so i want to say if you want to uh you know send us questions you know on the chat you're welcome to to pop it in the chat there if you want questions uh uh we will try and see if we can keep it on the facebook feed um but in you know ideally sort of just pop the question there in the chat and we'll try and get to that for you as well yeah while we're waiting for questions I, it's a question i often hear people well not that i have that much contact with people who are anti-vaccination but people would say they just don't understand how the one thing is actually that the the the, the virus was created for the vaccination because mm. someone wants to make money and the other thing is that how could someone create a vaccination that's that's effective and and safe in such a short how could they do that yeah. in such a short period of time you know i again i think it's 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 uh, it's easy to to make a statement like that but the reality of that sort of so okay obviously vaccination the principle of vaccination maybe what i should do is i should have ex explained sort of how our body works in terms of an infection and how it deals with that and then obviously you know why we vaccinate so um i've i've i've, I've gotten a few um slides for us so that you know to, to try and explain in a in a sort of fairly simple way what happens when you know when our viruses work what happens when we get exposed to them and things like that so so because i mean these are all questions that we get asked regularly um 
you know, for all these years, people would go on holiday in Zanzibar or somewhere, and they would be expected to have a yellow fever injection, and they would just say, yes, thank you, give it to me, baby, I want to go to the beach. <laughs> um, and now, all of a sudden, you know, it's all these things, yeah, but, you know, how do we know it's safe, and, you know. So, anyway, so let's start off with, um, uh, with a, um, uh, this is a virus coronavirus you can see there it's got these little sort of spikes but a virus is not the same as as um, let's say a, a human cell so in principle this virus has got a very simple cell membrane it's basically a little pocket that contains just some RNA so the virus itself cannot grow it cannot replicate it really can do nothing except for the fact that that it has this little pocket of RNA. So RNA is, in a, I think the easiest way to explain that is to say that is the recipe book, the coronavirus recipe book, that, that has the recipe in for how do you bake a coronavirus. So step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, and in principle each one of those steps has a little protein structure called an amino acid that it builds up and that really gives all the little building blocks for the membrane and for all the little bits of the coronavirus that that we now know one of those little bits is called a spike protein which is really a, an extension of this protein on the surface of the of the virus now so so the rna is in the virus but you know it's a little bit like you can have a cookbook in your kitchen but you're not going to have food on the table so someone has to prepare the food. Now the virus cannot prepare the food. So what happens is the virus hitches a ride. You sniff up the virus when you go and drink coffee with your best friend. Um, and now this Delta variant virus with its RNA inside of it gets into your nose. And once it's inside your nose, it'll find a cell or a specific target. So it wants to get into the respiratory epithelium, into the, the lining of the, of, the, of the nose and the lungs. Um, and it binds that 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 cell then binds to a specific little uh, we, call it, we call it the receptor. It's basically like a key that looks for a lock where it will fit into. So once the virus then finds that specific place that it can attach itself to, the virus has then has the the cell can then transport the virus into the cell. And once the virus is inside the cell, it will then release its RNA. Okay, so that virus is not sitting in the DNA. It's not going to the DNA of your cell. Your cell's DNA is sitting in your nucleus. I'll show you the cell now. And so this RNA is just in the sort of what we call the cytoplasm of the cell. And in your cytoplasm, you have a cook that is busy making your body's protein. So there's, you know, he's busy taking the recipes from your DNA. And what this RNA does is it just slips its own recipe in there in between. And now your body's own little cook, all the, the, the ribosomes inside your cytoplasm is now cooking up your own body protein, but it is also cooking up some nice viruses. Now, obviously, those viruses can then go out of the cell, you sneeze them out again, and that's how you infect other people. So the virus makes use of your own cell's own production system to make more copies of itself. Okay. Now, this is a sort of a complex slide, but but in principle, if you look at this now, you'll see there on the left hand side, we have some coronaviruses that is entering the cell or the environment. And in your body, you have these things. You'll see this sort of nasty looking fingery uh, cell on the on the left lower bit, which is called a macrophage. And these cells are there to look for foreign things. They don't, they don't like cancer cells. They don't look like viruses. They, they are your, body, your body's first line of defense. So they see these coronaviruses that's lurking around. They grab onto them. And once that coronavirus gets into the macrophage, the macrophage digests the coronavirus and breaks it up into little pieces. And it looks for things that it can recognize. So a little bit like... When you go to the police station, they take a photo of yours and they put that photo of yours on their network. And now when you, when the criminal now, you know, arrives in Johannesburg 
in Hilbrau, they they have never met the criminal, but they see the photo and they know, wait a minute, this is the criminal. Okay. So your body works in the same way. So it's looking for that police file photo in the coronavirus case. It's the spike protein. Mm -hmm. And once it sees that that uh, that police file photo, it will it will it will it will transmit that image to lots of other cells in your body, and they produce little what we call immunoglobulins. They are your body's antibodies. So it's like a little heat-seeking missile. That little antibody is programmed to look for Mr. Coronavirus spike protein. It doesn't care about anything else. It just looks for that spike protein. Now, you can see there sort of towards the right upper hand of your screen. Now you've got these, these little antibodies and they know what a spike protein is. So as soon as they see a virus anywhere, the antibody attacks the virus or it latches onto the virus and it calls the T cells to come and kill the virus. So it, it, it immobilizes the virus by latching onto it and then it calls your own body's immune cells to come and fight that infection. And that is the way that we that we can, so if you've had the coronavirus infection in the first place, then you've got these antibodies and the next time you go and visit your friend and she coughs on you, your body immediately says, wait a minute, I know these things, let's kill them before they can actually get into my body. So, and that that's how they work. Now, these antibodies have a lifespan, so they don't last forever. If you don't see a coronavirus ever, that police file photo gets stored first in the, you know, in the back office and then later on the archives and let, later on it's on the police, uh, you know, police station's floor there under all the firearm license applications, you know. So, so the thing is your body does the same thing. When you don't get exposed to that virus, then you don't have, the antibodies get less and they get parked away. So if you get, it's, that's why if we get the flu or a cold, we could have it this year and the next year we could have the same thing and now we get sick again because our antibodies have forgotten that we had that same virus last year. Mm. All right. Now, when we want to vaccinate someone, this is our cell. Okay, now that blue dot in the middle is the nucleus. That's the, the center of the cell. Or I want to say the brain of the cell. Your DNA is stored inside that nucleus. So your DNA looks almost like RNA, but it's a double strand and it contains the blueprint for everything that your body needs to build, everything that your body needs to produce. Um, that has That is the library of recipe books that you cannot believe. Okay, so it has a recipe for everything in there. Okay. Now, what we do is, under normal circumstances, when your body needs a, let's say, a thyroid you know, hormone, it will take that DNA, that specific portion, that chromosome, it will unwind it, and it will make an RNA copy of that DNA for the thyroid. So it just makes a copy of one little recipe within that big library, and that RNA is then used to produce thyroid hormone or to do whatever so that does the function once you've produced enough that RNA is packed away so the DNA stays in the nucleus the RNA moves to the outside of the cell where all these other those purple and yellow and all these other we call them organelles where they actually help in actually sustaining the cell and producing this so the cook that cooks the broth is sitting on the outside the master brain, the librarian, sits in the nucleus. All right. So when we take an RNA and we say, well, okay, we want to show, we want to, we want to give the cell this police file photo so that it knows what this virus will look like. Mm -hmm. We then inject that RNA into the body, and that RNA moves into the cell on the in the outside of the cell. It doesn't go into the nucleus, so it doesn't go into the DNA. It the cook that cooks the broth is sitting on the outside. So the RNA goes there because that's where the stuff gets cooked. Your body then, now we, we in the vaccine, we, we've only put the RNA that produces that little spike protein. So we don't put the whole virus RNA in, this, in there. So we don't want your body to produce viruses. We want it to produce just that little bit, the police file photo. So it produces that little piece of RNA and that piece of RNA then gets pushed to the outside of the cell and now your body can say, wait a minute, this protein doesn't belong here, let's attack it. 
But because it's just a little protein, it's not going to make you sick. It's not going to make you, it's not going to give you COVID. Okay, your body will react to that protein because we want your body to produce antibodies. And for that, it needs to recognize that this thing is foreign and we need to develop antibodies against this. So why do we get like fever and headaches and sometimes feel a little bit off after the vaccine? It's because your body is busy producing the antibodies that you want to protect you against the real thing. So it's busy making photocopies of that police file photo and making little heat-seeking missiles so that once the, the villain arrives, it'll immediately know this is the virus, let's kill it. Okay. So now what we've done is there's no viruses on the left-hand side. We've only got these little spike proteins that is now being produced by the macrophage because we gave the macrophage the recipe to do this. It's now producing this, but the whole cascade on the right-hand side is exactly the same. So once the real virus arrives, the body already knows what this looks like. It already knows, you know, what it's going to, and then it starts attacking the virus. So now the virus doesn't have a chance to start replicating, can't get into your lungs, can't make you severely ill. So the idea is that the virus arrives, but your body can attack quickly before the virus has a chance to really make you sick. So that is how the vaccine then works. And the question is, you know, is the vaccine effective? If we look at a country like Israel, now where there's been lots of vaccination, if you look at the patients that are fully vaccinated, the lower green line, you can see just how many people, and we say seriously ill as anybody that needed to go into hospital. So you can see the green line at the bottom. You can see the patients in red are the ones that have had one or one of, of the vaccines that haven't received both. And then you can see the yellow line are the number of people that got sick during the course of the last two, three months in Israel that have not been vaccinated. So in terms of your risk of getting into hospital, it's about 25% higher if you have not had the vaccine than someone that has had the vaccine. So, And how safe, if I can interrupt you, how safe it is, is it to get the vaccination while you are so actively busy with cancer treatment, chemo, yeah, so radiation? I think it's a good question. I think uh, lots of patients ask me that. So in principle, um, remember when, we, when we're doing chemotherapy, the chemo affects the bone marrow. The bone marrow produces things like white cells and, and red cells and so on. The bone marrow primarily doesn't produce the antibodies. So you can still get a vaccine. Your body will still produce the antibodies and um, it will still react when you get the, when, when you get the real infection. Um, your, the, the white cells are important for things if you get an abscess or if you get a, a bacterial infection. That's why you, where you need white cells that actually will produce, well, pus is really made out of white cells. So if you, if you want to fight an infection, then you actually need to have uh, the, the, the bone marrow working. So short, the short answer then is it is very safe while you are mm. getting chemotherapy, while you're busy with surgery, radiation that you can actually have your vaccine and it's not going to be detrimental to the patient the only patients that we so the, the only patients that in, in fact is problematic so if we give someone treatment that 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 switches off their immune system let's say that it's a patient that has had a kidney transplant mm -hmm. so the problem is you are actively preventing your body from making antibodies that means that when you have one or two doses of the vaccine, your body might not be able to make good vaccination. So there's some data that says maybe in cancer patients, we should maybe be giving them three doses of the vaccine and not just two, because they might not actually be producing uh, such good amounts of, of antibodies. Currently, obviously, because we still have limited vaccines and lots of people that need it, um, we have this issue that the you know we we have to say well okay you can only have two for now but i think long term as we are learning more and more that we'll probably find that they will say okay maybe if you if you're a cancer patient you know chemotherapy maybe you should have two and then you should have you know a third dose let's say three months or four months or whatever later mm. so oh okay so i must that must be quite uh <sighs> sort of good news for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, and I think the thing is, 
obviously, if someone is on chemotherapy, let's say they do get coronavirus infection. Now, the problem is the chemo itself is not going to make you get a worse infection. But if you are overweight, if you have diabetes, and now you have now you get sick from the coronavirus and now other infections will have a much higher chance of getting into your body. Mm -hmm. So the problem is while you are busy with chemotherapy, you really want to sort of prevent or protect yourself against getting all kinds of other infections. And when you have when you get sick with coronavirus and you have to then be admitted to hospital, then unfortunately you are now exposed to an environment where there are obviously lots more risk for infection. So that is the that is the problem. So um, so that's why we say it would be safer for you to have your vaccine, make your risk of getting severe COVID much less, and that keeps you out of an environment where you can get other infections which would be much more dangerous for you while you're busy with your treatment. Okay. And you can get it any time during your treatment. You can... Yeah, yeah, and I mean, from my side, I would, I would normally my patient would say, you know, the sooner, you know, you, it takes a little bit of time. So once you get your vaccine, it takes time for your body to build up those antibody reserves. Um, so and generally, we'll see, we'll say, well, you sort of need about four weeks for it to be effective. And I mean, I, 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 I have seen quite a few patients now in this wave that we've had of infections is. Uh, they, they, you know, they opened the vaccination, they went for the vaccination, but unfortunately they were already in a process where they either have gotten infected or they were you know, exposed to the virus and now they got infected a week after having had the, the, the vaccine. And now they still got quite sick because they haven't, the vaccine really hasn't had a chance. To, to, to work up the body's immune system to protect them. So that's so, what usually happens where people now sometimes would say they've had the vaccination and now it's the vaccination that's yeah, causing them to be ill. Yeah. It's maybe that they've actually were they, exposed to COVID yeah. uh, or the, before yeah. the having... And I mean, there are some of the vaccination sites which are, which are quite busy. And I mean, you can imagine, I, I know uh, um, a colleague of mine, they, they, they have a, a vaccination site um, in, in um, you know, sort of the West Coast. And I mean, the personnel all, all got COVID. Even, in, in, even though they are all very careful and very meticulous, but the issue is you are now, you've got a flow of people coming in that is now you know, bringing exposure. And I mean, this Delta variant is, is really very, very, uh, uh, it's not aggressive in terms of killing patients, but it is aggressive in terms of being able to transmit from one person to another very easily. So, um, and that unfortunately then created a situation where people got sick very easily. So, so I do think there are some patients that when they got into a very busy, very crowded environment that maybe they got, they got uh, exposed to the virus. And, uh, you know, obviously the fact that they've had the vaccine, it wasn't enough, enough time to protect them. So, yeah. So that's one of the things, you know, it's always that again, you know, if we do research, you have to, you have to test lots of patients to really make sure that this thing A is the cause of this and not the fact that they had B. Yes. Um, so that, that thing of, of um, we talk about statistical significance. So you have to test lots of things and lots of different options to be able to say that truly this factor is better or worse than that factor. So anecdotal evidence or anecdotal things is when someone says well you know i heard my 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 neighbor went and he got the vaccination and like four days later he got sick so obviously it must be the vaccination that causes that so that that is something we would call anecdotal um and you know for the same reason uh you know if someone uh, climbs in his car and then drives off and then uh, you know drives over another person you know, it, it's, 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 it happened, but it's not, you know, the, the, the reality is every time someone climbs in a car, he's not going to kill someone. Mm -hmm. So there's a chance it could happen, but it's quite small. So the fact that your neighbor is the guy that drove the car doesn't mean that every person around you is going to get in the car and kill someone. Mm -hmm. So that whole thing of, we, you know, causality to saying that A led to B and it will always do that. And I think that's where the you know the scientific research comes in to say, well, you have to prove that one thing really led to another. Otherwise, you know, what's then it's just an anecdotal thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And I think I've heard quite a few people saying in, in um, ICUs, definitely like you said with the research in Israel, that most people in ICU now are people that have not been vaccinated. In yes, so I think if we look at our local figures in the Western Cape, um, in a way less than about 1% of the patients that are in the ICU uh, are patients that are vaccinated. So 99% are patients that have not been vaccinated. So unfortunately, I mean, it's not because the people didn't want to, it's just because by the time this third wave hit us um, in sort of July, uh, we, we really weren't set up to be able to vaccinate significant numbers of people. So, I mean, we, we, we really, I think we vaccinated uh, in South Africa just over about 10 or 11 million people. It's 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 only a sixth of the population, and most of those people, I think about 60%, have only had one dose of the Pfizer vaccine. So the reality is that, 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 that we we're still not in a in a space where we could say fantastic, you know, we we over yeah, the worst, yeah. or whatever. But I think hopefully now that the the, the FDA have, have approved the Pfizer um, vaccination, hopefully a lot of people will feel more comfortable will actually with getting it and going for it. And yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's, there's a system and it, and it goes for chemotherapy and things like that as well for cancer treatments. If you have a treatment that, that, that you can prove to them with an, you know, a, a big number of patients, and I mean, so Pfizer and Moderna both had to test several thousands of people to be able to show to the FDA that they could potentially qualify for emergency use. So with emergency use, they'll say, all right, you can use it, but you have to keep tabs on every person and you have to report every single little side effect. So that's why we had all these reports of, oh, now there's blood clots and now there's myocarditis and now there's that. The reality is it was, it was a very small numbers of patients, but because they were under obligation now to report every single little thing, we it was sort of a little bit over exaggerated to a certain extent now the fda i mean i, 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 I the other day i had a paper where they just looked at like va so veterans um, administration for all the the soldiers and things in in the states and they had like 29 million doses that was given and they 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 you know gave all the you know all the whole list of every little side effect that they had so so there there are millions and millions and millions of doses that have been given internationally and each of those people have been followed up and every single adverse event has been reported so and based on that the FDA had now said all right you have now produced so many people over basically a year almost that that we can see all right we we we, we know theoretically where the pitfalls are we definitely can see that the risks with the virus is a lot worse and the risk of, of the of the vaccine mm -hmm. that goes for any vaccine for flu vaccine for polio vaccine for measles um, but the one true thing about and we see that with measles as well as soon as you have a certain percentage of people in the community that don't vaccinate their children then we see a break up breakout of measles in in the school for example and now you've got you know uh, 20 or 30 kids dying because why not because not necessarily even because they were not fully vaccinated, but because the community protection effect that we sort of bank on for most infections, things like measles, things like polio, um, uh, smallpox, those things we, we really trust that there's a good community immunity mm -hmm. um, that has been enough people vaccinated so that the transmission of the virus from one person to another is going to be more difficult and my kid is not going to get sick. Mm. So I would really be upset if my child died of, of measles because someone else decided that they don't want to do mm. something. This is the same thing. This is not an I game. This is a team sports, mm. this whole thing. If we do not as a community say, so I think again, I became a doctor because I wanted to help patients. If every time in my life I had to say, Yo, it's three o'clock in the morning, I'm really tired, I want to go to sleep, I've worked for two days, I, don't, I really don't feel like getting up and going to, to deal with that gunshot wound. There would have been hundreds of people that would have died because I put my own comfort above my patients. 
So Melina, our practice, we work with cancer patients every day. We made a decision to say, we are here for our patients. We are not here for ourselves. And therefore, if it, it is our responsibility to look after our patients, to keep them healthy, we will take the vaccine in spite of the fact that there might be some small risk to that. We are close to, I think, 22, 25 people working in, in Paxo. None of us have had any serious concerns uh, or any serious issues. You know, the side effects that one or two had after the vaccine were really mild. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, from my side, I, I have no doubt that it's... that. It, we had the Johnson vaccine. Yeah. So it wasn't, yeah. Um, yeah. It was the first one that was available yeah. here. Um, I, th uh, this, I, I saw in the chat that, um, you know, there's, uh, I see, uh, uh, so it says, uh, evening, I had my first chemo session in the 28th of July, and then, I, and then contracted COVID two weeks after that. I was fortunate to have had the J&J &J vaccine in May this year, um, and I had very mild symptoms. And I, yeah, I mean, that I agree with you that this is typically what I see is people who have had been, you know, people who have been vaccinated, have um, generally will have very mild symptoms. It's not that they don't, I mean, they, they still feel horrible, mm -hmm. but I am not aware of any of my colleagues or anybody that I know that have been fully vaccinated that ended up in hospital. Mm -hmm. So I think from that perspective, I have no doubt that being vaccinated protects you against serious infection. I think that's a really important thing for me. So. So I think in cancer, again, if you now have cancer in COVID, it is bad enough. Mm. If you still then have to say, okay, I can't visit my mom and I can't do this, or you 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 have breast cancer and you go and visit your mom because you feel a bit sad and you infect your mom and she dies, it is going to put an extra burden on you dealing with the mom's death as well as dealing with your breast cancer. So. In my mind, you know, you really want to limit the other stuff that can go wrong as best as possible when you are fighting for your life with one disease. Mm. Yes, and to try and find other ways of of getting that social uh, support, and uh, you know, even if at, at least we've got a WhatsApp video call and Zoom. Mm. I know it's not the same as the personal interaction. But, I mean, we are far better off than showing mm. people mm. earlier centuries having to go through plagues and having to yeah. totally have no yeah. contact with each other. Um, Etienne, you know, I'd just like to ask you, you mentioned, I think, this week that we may be going to be have this virus with us if you look at previous talking about plagues and stuff that uh, it may be still with us another yeah. year or so yeah I, you know if you look at the 1918 flu uh in south africa it basically took three years for that flu to run its course if i can put it that way um and so I, you know, we are now from, you know, if you think we, 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 we started lockdown just before April last year. Mm. Uh, so we are not even 18 months into this whole thing. But the fact that we're now getting uh, the vaccinations, is that not going to help to, to try and... I, I think, yes, if, if we can vaccinate people. So as I explained, your antibodies don't last forever. Oh. So the thing is, you know, you, you sort of need to vaccinate let's say 70 or 80 percent of the people in time so that everybody still has antibodies but let's say you take it takes you two years to vaccinate everyone then the problem is you might now have an issue where um you know by the time the last guy gets his his vaccine the first ones have already actually lost the antibodies mm. so so that that is part of the concern that we have and then obviously um, we are we are vaccinating using this specific spike protein. The problem with these RNA viruses is they tend to change frequently. The reason why we have to you have to get a a, um, a flu vaccine every year is because the viruses change. They have different variants. They still it's still a flu an influenza virus, mm. but it the the protein structure on the surface, the things that you you know that that police file photo. You know, the guy grows a mustache or, you know, you know, puts glasses on. The viruses do the same thing. They change their structure a little bit so that they look different, so that your immune system don't recognize this virus as being the same one from last year. 
So this is the problem is now we've had the alpha variant, which was the first. Then we had the beta variant that caused all the havoc in December here in, in the country. Mm. Then we got the delta variant from from India, um, and that mm. is really what we're seeing now with this third wave, and certainly much more transmissible, probably eight times as much as, as what the beta variant was. Um, we that's why this wave. It, you know, the previous one, we, we started sort of in November, December was the peak, by January we're through it. Mm. Now we've been July, August, we're running into September, and we just, looks like we're just over the peak now. So mm. it's it's a much longer, much slower process now. So countries where, obviously more first world countries where they can get the vaccination and people can get it like quickly, mm. and mm. It's, they, get, they have a better chance of really yeah being safer yeah um, so i showed you that data from from israel uh, israel was 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 very proactive and they you know they could vaccinate uh, i think 90 percent of the population or whatever. and i mean today there was a publication that said well there's now this new surge of coronavirus cases in uh, in, in israel and and again you know the data clearly shows it is being driven by the group of people that were not vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones that bring the virus and 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 you know sort of spread the virus in the community. Yeah. And the same principle applies. If you've had the vaccine, you you're gonna get the virus, but you're not gonna get very sick uh, if you haven't had the vaccine. So in the UK, um, you know when they looked at a hundred thousand people, um, you can see the difference if they were not vaccinated. How many of those people? would end up in hospital. Now we currently, I think we're running at about, was it 400 cases a day or something in South Africa, new cases, uh, you know, at the peak we were far beyond that. So this is if you have 200 new cases a day, uh, and if you look at one month, you can see the difference if the people were vaccinated, how many of those people would end up in hospital. You know, it is a huge difference from the anti or the the non-vaccinated group. So that this is data from the UK. Uh, they have had quite a successful vaccination campaign. They have a majority of people. Uh, this is from the United States. Uh, you can see there 162 million vaccinated Americans. America, I think if I remember, they have plus or minus. Uh, they have about 250 or 260 million people in their country. So. This is 162 million people. Sure. And keep in mind that all of those people have been checked. And you know, this is why I say the FDA has huge amounts of data about whether the vaccine is safe. Now, mm -hmm. just look at the green bar is that you would still get COVID disease. Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe not get a sick, but you, you, you still have that. You have an eightfold reduction. Your chance of ending up in hospital, 25% less. Okay, and your, your chance of dying, 25% less. So, so you can see the difference between the vaccinated group at the blue bar and the unvaccinated group, the green bar, and, and what a difference that makes. So if there's any doubt whether, again, whether, you know, whether there's proof from first world countries where they were able to vaccinate lots of people. Now, unfortunately, in the States as well, they have issues where they have certain areas where there are not as many people. Uh, there are other areas where people are very keen and they've been vaccinated fully. Um, so, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that we are quite clearly pro-vaccination. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no one's going to uh, report me to the health professionals council because <laughs> of my reckless uh, uh, comments. Sorry, no, so. clearly not. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't know if, if there's really if there's any questions. I just like to repeat that you're more than welcome to to send it in, and we really would like to answer. Um, I don't know, in the meantime, I think I'd like to just from a psychological perspective, just say that um, the, just a helpful, a few steps that can help you cope with uh, challenges uh, like in this case, uh, COVID, but also any challenge like cancer. Um, and I'm going to give credit to um, uh, Dr. Harris, and he is a, 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 a acceptance and commitment therapy trainer as well as a medical practitioner and he um, was just he gave us a very useful acronym it's basically called face COVID, and it stands for some practical steps just to help us deal with challenging situations and the F stands for just focus on what you can control 
because very often we are busy upsetting ourselves mm. or stressing and worrying about things that's actually basically not within our control. And if there's just one thing that you can remember, rather focus on what you can control. And that's usually things like your own actions, not um, subjecting yourself to watching stuff on YouTube videos or that you don't really know where are they getting this information from. Um, so control, focus on controlling your own actions, focus on controlling your thoughts. Try and think thoughts that you really can say that you can, it's true, it's based on logic and it's helpful. Try and avoid thoughts that are not logical or true, you don't have any evidence for it and it's clearly not helping you, it's just making you feel worse. Um, yeah, and also, if I can use the analogy of a storm, um, if there's a storm at sea, then boats would throw anchor in the harbour, and that would help them not being to be not blown out into sea. In the same way, we can throw anchor in an emotional storm by using certain principles, um, which I can use. It's the ACE, the ACE analogy where the A stands for just acknowledge and accept your feelings. Um, because most negative feelings, it's that all negative feelings are normal. And if we can just actually acknowledge them, it paradoxically uh, helps us to, to bring down the intensity. But if we start stressing about the fact that we're stressing or feeling down about the fact that we're feeling down, it just makes things even worse. So just acknowledge and accept your feelings and then also just um, come back into your own body that's basically using the principle of grounding um, of just doing things to reconnect with your body that also helps to bring down the intensity of anxiety and fear and i mean you can do whatever works for you that would be for instance just pressing your feet down into the ground or pressing your spine into your chair, pressing your fingertips against one another. It's all ways of just uh, reconnecting with your body. And then also just engage in what you are doing. So when you physically connect it with your, and, and all the while not sort of ignoring your feelings or emotions, you can still acknowledge, accept them, but just bringing the intensity down by, um, basically re-engaging, um, coming back into your body and re-engaging with what you are busy at the moment. And we can use simple techniques like just focusing on five things that you can see, or four things that you can hear, three things that you can smell or taste, and then refocusing on coming back into the year and now, what am I doing now, focusing on it, and that will just help to, to calm the intensity of the feeling. And to also know that Feelings can't be permanent. So they know they, they sometimes feel like overwhelmingly intense, like you are just going to drown in the intensity of this feeling. And then it's very helpful to remind yourself that just like feelings are like waves. I mean, a wave, it has to pull back into the ocean again. Um, and the feeling will also subside. And you just have to breathe and ground yourself and... Um, just get through it and then it will be a bit more, it will be easier. Uh, it can't stay as intense the whole time, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, yes, and if you now more f uh, fully basically accepting your, your emotions and being more present in the here and now, um, that's also then very helpful if you um, can just that will help you to basically do the, the the acronym COVID, and that is to engage to committed action. It will help you to do things that are actually more helpful, like um, taking active steps in preventing you 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 know avoiding contact with people, doing uh, practical steps to stay healthy, and also to to actively um, practice self care, just being good good to yourself mm. and your loved ones. Um, it's also important that O stands for opening up to you, making room for those difficult feelings, making room for 
self-compassion and self-kindness. We are, it's very often it's very easy for us to be kind towards other people and to, um, yeah, and to be. But on ourselves, we are very often we're not as um, compassionate and kind towards ourselves. Um, so just remember to, to to give yourself a little hug. I, I often tell my patient, just imagine that you're sitting, a, a part of you sitting next to another part of you that's actually feeling very down today and just seeing yourself giving that part of you a hug and saying, you know what, you've come a long way, just mm. keep on going. Um, and then the, the V stands for values, just stick to your values and preferably also values of kindness and care. The I stands for um, identify resources. Um, and I know it's difficult in COVID if you can't always spend as much time being physically present with loved ones. But still, there's different ways of, 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 of actively trying to identify resources and your social support network, um, even if it is like being take, having a Zoom conversation or whatever. And then the D, uh, very practically, is to keep your distance and to disinfect, <laughs> <laughs> which is more on a, a medical level. But yeah, so that's the acronym FACE COVID. And then, yeah, the life is full of storms and challenges. But in the words of Winston Churchill, I think that's also a very nice quote. If you're going through hell, just keep going. And eventually, I believe that things will get better. It's just trying to put one foot in front of the other and to keep going. Yeah, I think that's very good advice. I mean, it's good advice for, for anything, any, for cancer, any for whatever, you know. So, um, uh, and I think that's one thing that I've learned is, you know, that the reality of life is, you know, unexpected things. I always say things can get worse. You know, so you must never think like, oh, you know, this is the worst thing and you feel very sorry for yourself because now, because the reality is something worse can happen to you. The second thing, fortunately, is that things are almost never as bad as you expect them to be. So people always tend to anticipate that this chemo is going to be this bad or whatever. And then in the end, they, you know, it's not that it's not the, that bad, but... I think our brains are wired to sort of remember the better parts of things better yes. than the bad yes. parts. So yes. Yes. Um, uh, I think the third thing is also exactly what you said is that, you know, and I, and I always reflect back in the, in the Bible, it says in the beginning. So I always say the first thing that God made was time because he knew that we would require time so that things, so time is a good thing because it runs at a specific constant amount. Mm -hmm. So doesn't matter how bad you feel now, an hour is still going to be an hour and 24 hours is still going to be 24 hours. So I always reminded myself I have to write an exam is remember just one thing is in five hours or six hours from now, I'm going to be finished with the exam. So I can stress as much as I want to whatever, but this six hours is going to pass just as, you know, the same amount of time as whatever. So, and I think that's important to say, well, you know, I've, this much time has gone past already it's only that much time left um, mm -hmm. so i think that's the thing you know so um so all of these things bind into that you know um you, the other thing you said is in terms of your your emotions and your thoughts mm -hmm. um and i always say it's important to think what you're thinking about mm -hmm. um because the thing is once you allow once you once you tell yourself, I think your brain's constantly asking yourself, I always think about this conversation happening in your brain. I'm not sure if you watch that movie Inside Out. But to yes. me, that's always this good thing about sort of this conversation that's a going in. Movie. Yeah. It actually really summarizes the, the principles yeah. of, of um, dialectical behavior therapy, which is also very much in, in terms of accepting that all emotions are normal and that they have a function. And that yeah. when I think it was happiness wanted to kick sadness yeah. out and then they, when sadness was kicked out of this little girl's body the the other emotions actually realized that we actually need sadness yeah. she's got a function so it's a very very good movie it's supposed to be a children's movie but i really, yeah, no, I I really it, tell all my clients yeah, that they yeah. should try and watch yeah. it no and i always tend to think about this thing is you know if you if you get this thought you know then there's this conversation about you know should we is this important should we you know should we 
keep this thought in a little you know special place or is it just one of those things i can say oh, well you know she said my hair doesn't look well you know put the, you know throw it there um so we always think to, to to you know sometimes we think that thoughts are are real so the fact that i thought this that means that it must be real and it's, it's not, not you know it's it's yeah true. so and i think that's important so um and just I said, remember the questions just ask yourself what i'm thinking now is it true is it logical yeah. is it helping me or is it making things worse and if the answer to the, both of those questions is no, then you know you know that obviously you put need it on to, the shelf. <laughs> yeah. Or you can also try and get evidence for this thought. Do I have evidence supporting this thought? Mm. Um, do I have evidence against this thought? And that's mm. but that's that's actually it's a bit uh, it's a bit more it's easier said than done. Mm. Uh, but it's mm. based the principles of cognitive behavior therapy is if we practice it the more we practice mm. doing that the mm. easier it is going to get and that's why if people struggle they come and see you so you can help them give them tools so all right so yeah. yeah so i know yeah i'm not sure if there's anything else um we i know in our in our you know facebook page we said that uh liesel Basson would be coming to you know share a bit of her journey with her cancer and and how actually that cancer journey had grown into something much bigger um and and you know, due to all kinds of logistic issues and communication problems um she's she's asked that she would rather come next time around so we're looking forward i think next time that we'll that we'll have her with us as well sharing a bit of her journey and i really want to encourage you um i know people are a little bit fed up with zoom and whatever so uh if you have suggestions about you know how what you know how we can do this so that people will have value when we don't do this because we enjoy it we do um and and, and um but we want to add value to people's yes. lives and to patients lives so um and that's why we put this on youtube and and, and and people can watch it so so if you have suggestions please you know on facebook send us a message uh, on the youtube channel uh, under dr etienne if you go there you'll find all the videos there um, you can leave a comment there. Um, so we're very happy to to mm. try and yeah try and uh, we want to make it worthwhile for people please, to log in. Please so. also suggestions regarding topics that you would like us to, to mm. address, um, or if you have a suggestion for someone that could be a guest speaker, we are mm. absolutely well actually um, would would welcome uh, suggestions mm. um, that stuff that you would like us to talk about. All right. So I think yeah on that note. Shall yeah. we say good night? I think yes. I, we, we've I, I've talked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope it was worthwhile. So I'm was, sure yeah. it's been Thanks very me. enlightening. Thank you. Uh, it's really I understand the whole <laughs> virus thing a bit better now. So thank you very much, Etienne. And I think it's very clear from our discussion, like discussion, like I said earlier, that uh, Dr. Myberg thinks that it's definitely very important that even if you're having your getting going through cancer treatment, that you should try and get your vaccination as soon as possible yeah. Um, um yeah so i hope that if some of you were still in doubt about having getting this or not i hope we've convinced you that um it would be the best thing for you to do to actually get it i hope you have a wonderful evening and that you will stay warm during the storm that we're having in the western cape so yeah good night everyone yeah cheers bye